We are celebrating Asian American heritage this month. Now, May was chosen to commemorate immigration of the first Japanese to the U United States on May 7, 1843, and also to mark the anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad on May 10 of 1869, which had significant contributions from Chinese workers. The railroad stretched from the West Coast to the East Coast and 15 to 20,000 Chinese immigrants were, made, were a major part of its construction. Initially, the construction superintendent deemed the immigrants unfit for the job, but the railroad needed workers and no surprise, many white people weren't interested. Conditions were brutal in the Sierra Nevada and Chinese workers weren't receiving the same pay as their white counterparts. Unlike white, white workers, Chinese workers had to pay for their own food and had to work longer hours. The railroad was fundamental to the development of the American West as it cut travel time across the United States from months to less than a week. To all of our members and guests with Asian American ancestry or connections, I say thank you for bringing your contributions and your diversity and culture that has enriched our lives and country. You'll hear more about this when uh, Ken announces our programming, but I'm excited about next week's program that will uh, celebrate our Asian American uh, neighbors right here in the Seattle area. Now we enjoy music, singing, and words of inspiration to kick off our meeting. Leading today's music is Don Murphy, accompanied by Jevin, Power, um, Jevin Powell. And then following music, Trish Bostrom will share our inspiration for the day. Good. We're uh, going to do a, a song about another cross-country uh, trip of the uh, of the uh, why did I the, this, the uh, Mercer girls who made it to Seattle. Anyway, this is a great song that was uh, written uh, for a show about Seattle, Seven Brides for uh, Seven Brides, Seven Brothers. Is that the name of the TV show? Perry Como. Okay. Uh, that was a movie. No, there was a TV show, wasn't there? Oh, okay. Anyway, I, I'm taking all my time up here. You got lots of help here, Don. <laughs> many of those people, many of you probably have never heard the song. So you can listen to the chorus. It's all we're going to sing the chorus once, and then we'll sing the chorus again at the end. It's really short. Kevin? Ready? Here we go. The bluest skies I've ever seen are in Seattle. And the hills of the greenest green in Seattle. Like a beautiful child growing up free and wild, full of hopes and full of fear. Full of laughter, full of tears, full of dreams to dance the years here in Seattle. In Seattle. Well, that was pretty good. So I'm a little excited about that. Here we go again. The bluest skies you've ever seen are in Seattle. And the hills, the greenest green in Seattle. Like a beautiful child growing up free and wild, full of hopes and full of fears, full of laughter, full of tears, full of dreams to last the years here in Seattle. In Seattle. Good. You sounded really good. <laughs> so President, former President Todd Sommerfeld always often let us in uh, St. Francis, St. Francis's prayer for peace. Uh, and our country and world needs prayers for peace. So please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is darkness, fear. Where there is despair, hope where there is doubt, faith, where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not seek so much to be understood as to understand, 
to be consoled as to console, and to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is dying that we are born to everlasting life. And all God's Rotarians said, Amen. All right, you are all now, you may be seated, please. <laughs> you are all officially indoctrinated now. You can be part of the Seattle Sounders March to the Match because the Emerald City group sings that song as they make their way from Pioneer Square to the stadium for every match. So you're ready. Don and Jevin, thank you for that, that great rendition. We appreciate that. And Trish, thank you for your words of inspiration. I'd like to also thank our, our greeters today. We had Ken Colleen, uh, Ryan Bunbury, and Tabitha Claus. Our meeting reporter who will capture the summary of our meeting today is Dan Mead Smith. And our Sergeant at Arms, he never gets credit for that role, Ken Grant. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> All right, we have uh, several guests here today that I'd like to uh, recognize. We have potential uh, member, uh, Amber Lingle. Amber, if you stand. Another potential member, Director of Sales and Marketing for the Embassy Suites, uh, Seattle Downtown Pioneer Square, Chris Block. Chris, are you here? And uh, another repeat, we have Roger Starkweather, Chairman of the Board for the Columbia Tower. Roger, welcome. And also from Columbia Tower is Connor Wright. He's Membership Director. Connor, welcome. And then you'll be uh, hearing from our speaker, Tammy Canavan uh, with Visit Seattle, but joining her is our newest corporate member, Michael Woody with Visit Seattle. Michael, thank you. Michael is a senior VP of community engagement and public affairs. So uh, we're very happy to have Visit Seattle uh, as our newest corporate member. So thank you. All right, and now I would like to bring up to the stage our Sergeant at Arms and Prince of Programs, Ken Grant, to introduce our short program. I love today, not because it's summy, because uh, I love tourism, which you're going to hear a lot about today. But here's the question Who here loves wine? Those that didn't put up their hands, the group meets on Tuesdays at seven but that's okay. Who here loves going to auctions? Well, that was surprising. I thought this whole city loved auctions. Anyway, my good friend, Jimmy Piha is here to chat with us more today about the incredible work being done at the auction of Washington Wines. Please give it up for Jamie. I can't believe that there was only a couple of hands that were raised. <laughs> auctions can be really fun. And there's in our auctions, there's lots of wine. So, you know, I'm going to change your mind by the end of this presentation. Um, okay, so do I just use this with the green arrow to change things? Okay. Um, so when I heard the theme of Rotary was step up, I knew that it was a perfect fit for the Washington wine industry. It is an industry that steps up. I've been involved with the Washington wine industry for more than 30 years, and I have been able to watch it grow from its infancy to the world-class wine region it is today. In the early 90s, I worked at the Washington Wine Commission when there were only 80 wineries in the entire state. We knew everyone by their first name. Business was done on a handshake. What followed was a period of rapid growth and 10 plus years, 10 plus years later, Thank you for that. I do that to people all the time and I'm not speaking into the microphone. Um, 10 plus years later, there were 350 wineries in the state. Today, there's over a thousand wineries statewide. The vision of the auction of Washington wines is lofty to inspire the world to experience Washington wine. But our specific mission is to uplift the Washington wine industry, create awareness, and we do that through celebrated events and programs that give back to the community and to the industry. When people visit our state, and I'm sure the tourism department can attest to this, when people visit our state and they get a closer look at wineries and the people behind the scenes, they come away feeling the camaraderie and spirit that is so palpable. Why? 
for the wine industry, it's because it's built on unity and collaboration and the early visionaries created a strong foundation built to last. <clears throat> I like to share this triangle so people understand how the wine industry, how it works together. At the top of the pyramid is the Washington Wine Commission. It is a state commodity commission and all wineries and growers in the state are required to pay into the commission. And, um, and so that's, they are also the marketing arm of the industry and they pay into the commission based on production. The Washington Wine Institute supports the Washington wine industry uh, through policy and legislative work. And they try to reduce barriers to business for the wine industry and successfully navigate within the government policy. The auction of Washington wines was created to be the philanthropic arm of the wine industry. It also represents all wineries in the state and works to uplift the industry through awareness and create uh, increased perceived value of Washington wine. So what's at the top of the stairs? Since we're stepping up, we're at the top of the stairs here. These are the most important things that are happening within the wine industry today. The number one thing is world-class research. Washington's, Washington's wine research program is one of the few in the country, actually in the world, that has been funded solely by the growers and vintners of Washington state. It is guided and driven by the industry, and all those results are accessible to vintners and wine grape growers, not just in this state, but around the country. Sustainability. Sustainable WA. It's a program that was created just in the last year. It's been years in the making, but it's the first statewide certified sustainability program built for and by the industry, specifically for Washington vineyards. Diversity. Diversity is top of mind for all of us these days. And for the auction, we are making strides in inclusiveness in areas that include vineyard workers, people of color, women winemakers, diverse age ranges, LGBTQ, and many others. There is a lot more work to do, but change is happening. Regional marketing and tourism. I think I'm going to leave that one alone since we have a speaker coming up here in just a few minutes, but I will say that Washington wineries are located all around the state now. There are many areas to visit, and uh, it attracts people from all over the world to come to Washington state. So from exporting wine to fostering trade relations, and uh, to hometown wine enthusiasts, the industry is building business from all angles. Let's take a quick look at some facts. I'm sure you all know that Washington is the second largest wine producing state in the country. Uh, we're only second to our friends in California, and uh, we, are, we, we cannot compete with them in terms of quantity, but we certainly can compete in terms of quality, and we do. Uh, we have more than 1,000 wineries producing 17 million cases of wine a year, and that is contributing more than $8 billion to in-state economic impact. For the auction, I put some numbers up there. You can take a quick look. In 2019, we had our record year of $4.6 million, and we were all geared up for 2020 to hit that $5 million mark, and then covid so we had two years. We were we were down um, in 2020. We were down more than 50 percent. There was talk of hibernating the auction for a year or two to get through this, but we came back. We came through. We pivoted like everybody else, and we came back with 1.9 million. The next year we grew to 2.4, and this last year I'm proud to say that with an enthusiastic audience that had a lot of pent up energy, we raised 4.2 million this August. So hopefully uh, next year, this year that we're in right now, I can't say we'll hit 5 million, but I hope we hit the record that we hit in 2019. And if all of you are there, I'm sure you can help make that happen. Um, <laughs> so um, healthy land, healthy communities. That is the philanthropic platform of the Auction of Washington Wines. Over 36 years, we have raised $59 million for our philanthropic partners. Seattle Children's Hospital has been a partner for 36 years since the very humble beginnings of the auction of Washington wines. Funds primarily go to the uncompensated care fund, which provides necessary medical care for children in the entire region, regardless of a family's ability to pay. They also have regional uh, clinics in Eastern Washington and we support those as well. Thanks to Ted Baszler, who was a leader in the industry for many, many years, we have a world-class St. Michelle 
Wine Science Center, WSU Wine Science Center in Richland, where much of this uh, research is taking place. It also attracts students from all over the world, and we are hoping to keep those graduates in Washington State working in the wine industry. We primarily support research efforts which are critical to sustainability of the industry and address areas like climate change, fires, pest control, wine quality, and more. We have an industry grant partner, Vital Wines, and Vital Wines is doing some groundbreaking work building a bridge uh, for vineyard workers around the state so that they have better access to health and life services. So how do we raise all these funds? I know that's what you really want to know. How do we raise all these funds? We have really fun events. We have really fun wine events. And so just want to show you a little picture of what we do. I don't know why the slides are doing that, but obviously my technical skills are not excellent. So <laughs> um, our events typically happen in auction in August. We have a whole week long uh, series of events starting August 8th through the 13th. Uh, we have uh, more than 250 wineries involved throughout the weekend. 2,500 wine enthusiasts attend our events. We have uh, probably 20 celebrated chefs involved throughout the weekend, barrel auctions, industry awards, and live and online auctions. We do it for Washington Wine. We do it for our philanthropic partners, and we do it for you. I want to thank you for letting me talk to you today. And also want to let you know that our aspirational statement is Washington Wine, you belong here. And I want to cordially invite you all to join us in August for one of the funnest weekends uh, in the summer here and let you know that you belong here. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Appreciate that. And I think we, it wasn't Jamie's slides that were, we had a little bit of a, I think, translation in the copying of those slides. So apologies for that. All right, I, I am especially pleased to introduce our main program speaker today. Uh, I think most of you know that my day job is in the Seattle Sports Commission uh, and Visit Seattle was the former parent of Visit Seattle. Uh, and then when I took it over, we transitioned out as an independent, but uh, we obviously work very, very closely with our partners at Visit Seattle. Now, Tammy has a passion for the tourism in industry and a track record of success in developing high functioning teams and organizations. She has a career that has spanned 30 plus years and two countries, including executive leadership at Tourism Vancouver, CEO of the Tacoma Regional Convention and Visitors Bureau, architect and, and, and inaugural chair of the Washington Tourism Alliance. I did not know that, Tammy, that was fun to, fun fact to hear. She was president and CEO of the Monterey County CBB, and now president and CEO of Visit Seattle. She's earned a number of accolades over her careers, including recognition as one of the 25 most influential people in the meetings industry, twice as one of the top 25 most influential women in the industry, top 100 most inspirational women in the meetings industry. She won a Global Leadership Award from Destinations International, and in 2023 is being inducted into the Smart Women in Meetings Hall of Fame. I'm proud to call her a partner as a champion of Seattle tourism. Please welcome Tammy Canavan. Thank you. Kind of hoping she might shorten that a little bit. Um, Hi, <laughs> thank you for the invitation to, to be here. Um, I, I am delighted always to talk about tourism um, and to, to, to do things with Beth. Um, we are indeed important partners as we are with the, with the wine industry. And I will let you know um, that I am on the executive board of US Travel, which is the national um, advocacy arm. Um, and when they do pack fundraisers every year, there's an annual wine competition. And uh, Vital Wines was our entry for Washington State last year. It's Washington, Oregon, and California. Um, we crushed Oregon. We were very close to California, but California won this time. We'll get them next time. Um, but Vital Wines is, is just an, an incredible story. So if you don't know it about them, I encourage you to do so. And I encourage you to sample our Washington wines, because even though I spent 10 years in California, I, um, I advocate for Washington wines there. It's just a better place. 
So it's nice to be home. Um, and I, I am starstruck by many of you in the room. And in particular, I didn't know that I was going to be having lunch with Trish Bostrom. So I'm, I'm super starstruck about that and very grateful. So um, thank you. Not that the rest of you aren't impressive also, but there's Trish. Okay, so let's start with how many of you are in or connected with the tourism industry? Oh, okay. There are a few more of you actually that I would put in that category, those of you with towers and whatnots. Um, but um, that sort of helps me sort of gauge where I'm going to come from. And I'm glad that I went with sort of a high level overview today. So um, let's start just talking about overall impact. Tourism is an enormous um, industry for Seattle, for Washington state. Um, the numbers are on the screen on, on sort of the overall impact. We, when we, we talk about these a lot, 34 million visitors um, in Seattle and King County, 18 million of the, which actually sleep here and, and stay overnight. Um, they're spending a ton of money. They are dropping 690,000 in local taxes that we're not paying ourselves. Um, they are supporting 62,000 of our neighbors that work um, and, um, and the wages that come with it. So, so that all matters, but um, we're not quite where we were. Um, if, if you were hanging around for the last few years, you might've noticed that um, COVID was a little hard, uh, really, really hard on the, on the tourism industry. I know a lot of industries are affected. A lot of us were affected personally and professionally. Um, for the tourism industry, it was, it was pure decimation. And so it's great to see us starting to come back. I've got some historical numbers there on the screen. So you can see we're not quite there, but we're making our way. And we are feeling pretty darn bullish about um, what this year is going to look like with a full cruise season, with two convention centers, with, with all of the assets that we've got going on, the developments of the waterfront, all of the wonderful things. And there might be a sporting event or two um, happening, maybe some all-stars, some Kraken, um, and, and some other things going on. So... I want to talk a little bit about um, why we can't take this for granted. In the United States alone, never mind globally, in the United States alone, there are a minimum of 25 urban centers that have larger budgets than visit Seattle. Our budget is about 30 million. That's a lot of money, but it's not as much as some others have. Orlando has 115 million. From state tourism offices, there are 48 states that have more money than our state does to spend on tourism marketing. So what does that tell us? Tells us that this is a fiercely competitive arena and that we, it, it's just not something that we can take for granted. I hear often, well, we're so beautiful, people will come here anyways. I can tell you, and I can present many, many case studies that tell you that's not true. Because when the, the, the social media and the airwaves are cluttered with messages from our competitors, um, there are a lot of compelling images out there that make you think and in different ways. So we need to be on our toes, we need to be aggressive, and we need to be different. We need, we need to think differently about how we do that. So that being said, um, what, is, what is Visit Seattle? <clears throat> there are some fancy words on the screen. Pretty sure that's our mission statement. I just passed a year um, yesterday and I, I think it's our mission statement, we're working on that. Um, what does that really mean? It means um, we, our job is to grow the tourism economy. And we are a 501c6, that means that we are a, a, a nonprofit business, uh, we're a corporation, we have members, um, and we don't own anything. I mean, we market, we are the, 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 the custodians of the brand of Seattle and King County. We are the primary sales arm for the convention center. Uh, we are the storytellers. We, we, are, we are all kinds of things, but we don't own a darn thing. So what we are is a collective of businesses around Seattle and King County that do own some stuff. And so we make a lot of promises on their behalf and they deliver on that. And so it becomes a team sport. And, and that's um, incredibly important. And we do it for the numbers that I had on the screen before, for the economic benefit and the jobs and all that kind of stuff, but it's not actually about the visitors. It's about us. The reason we market our community and invite people to come here is to elevate our quality of life. It is to keep the restaurants that we love to go to alive. It is to um, have cultural exchange. It is to have, pri who's proud of the Kraken right now? <laughs> who's proud that we're hosting the All-Stars in July? <laughs> who's proud that we've got the coolest Space Needle, the only Space Needle, the coolest Space Needle on the planet, right? 
Who's proud that we have Mount Rainier right next door? Right? All of those things are what visitors come for, but really when they come and they spend their money, it's so that we can invest in things like waterfront development and rapid transit and, and other services that, that um, really serve us as residents. It is, it is about inspiring um, innovation. It is about the legacy that tourism leaves here for us, um, and you can never underestimate local pride. So um, there's a lot to say about that, and um, I could talk a lot, but sometimes it's better to have something else speak for you. So what I brought for you is our 2022 year in review that illustrates a little bit better what I'm talking about on, on all of the things, because, because our mission, I'm going to say this again, our mission is simple, right? We, we are here to grow the tourism economy to the benefit of our residents. How we go about that is really complicated. So I'm going to run a video and then I'm going to talk a little bit more. Is not the right music. It's better with our music. APEC meetings will be held here in Seattle.
and I'll quit there because that's great applause. <clears throat> I won't. Um, but it, it does help tell the story a little bit on, on how we go about our business is, is a little complicated. Um, you saw a little bit about how we lift up BIPOC businesses. 85% of the tourism industry is small business. 50 people or less. And that, that's a, a huge impact. I, I know we think of, of tourism as convention centers and big box hotels and, 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 and large retail outlets and really it's, it's about us. It's about us as the local people. So. Um, a lot of people think that we just do a lot of advertising, and we do do a lot of advertising, but um, we also, you, you saw a lot of people, um, and some of those were our partners, a lot of them were our staff people. Um, this is a very relational business, and, and, and how we go about growing the tourism economy is very labor intensive. Um, so we have four main business units, um, and of course administration to, to support all of them. Meetings and conventions, as bringing conventions and meetings here, and that's selling both the convention center and uh, self-contained meetings in hotels. We've got, or, or, or facilities, Bell Harbor Con Conference Center, et cetera, et cetera. Um, domestic leisure visitors are a huge target. We do direct to consumer um, advertising and marketing. We do uh, international market development where we're bringing over um, folks from overseas. They stay longer, spend more. They're a very important component. And then uh, community engagement and public affairs. So I'm just gonna touch very briefly on all of these. I know um, Ken asked me specifically to speak about the summit because everybody's super excited about that, as are we. Um, and I will say um, it, it is a fantastic facility. Has, has everybody been in the building? No. Oh, you gotta go. Um, okay, so we'll arrange for that, right? Um, as you can see from the numbers on the screen, both the arch, which is the original building, and the summit, the new building, are pretty much the same size. They're, they're not a lot of different. So, so, so when we call it an expansion, what does that mean to us? Those buildings are very, very different. Um, and how they sell and how they hold events is very, very different. So it allows us to do um, simultaneous events. We were actually turning away as much business as we were booking with only one convention center. So it allows us to do that. Um, it allows us to, to, to um, accommodate um, sometimes Events use both buildings, but usually mostly they, they use one. So we can have a flower show in one place and we can have a convention in another or a trade show in one place and, and other kinds of educational things in another. Um, and that that is um, a really critical element to how we sell the city. This is a picture of the ballroom. So for those of you that haven't been there, and I've been in a lot of ballrooms, 30 plus years in this business, it's a lot of ballrooms. <laughs> this is the most beautiful ballroom I've ever seen. And yes, I'm a little biased, um, but I also heard that from the journalists that we were touring around that are in, in trade magazines and, and looking at this. It is a stunningly beautiful business. And I think there are like 394 different light configurations that you can have in there. and It's crazy beautiful. Um, and um, there's more to it than that. Um, I, I talked about community benefit, and I just want to use some very specific examples. The summit building was $2 billion to build, pretty much. Um, of that, $93 million went to, five minutes, $40 million to affordable housing, $20 million to bicycle and pedestrian improvements, $10 million to freeway park improvements. In addition to that, so $93 million out of the $2 billion went to those causes. 150 million of work scope were awarded to minority and women-owned businesses, um, and 30% of the workers were from priority higher zip codes, so um, prior, that prioritized employment from um, economically distressed communities. In addition to that, um, we, as a community, embrace sustainability. We kind of hit it out of the park with this one. Um, Summit is projected to receive LEED Gold certification. We are aiming for platinum. And LEED certification, if you're not in the building industry, is means that you are um, embracing environmental practices as a standard. Um, that's the easiest way to explain it. There are only three other convention centers in the United States that are platinum, so uh, we feel like we're, we're going to achieve that. Um, also, rainwater treatment reduces irrigation needs by 89%. Solar panels improve Summit's energy performance by 30% over a baseline rating. Waste dehydrators convert, convert food scraps to fertilizer, and radiate, radiant floor heating uses sunlight and circulated water to maintain temperature. Convention Center, between both buildings, has waste diversion of 78%. That ranks in the top 5% of businesses nationwide. 
So all of those add to a really great story about Seattle. And um, if you haven't been in that building, it really does reflect the culture of the Pacific Northwest. It's, it's pretty exciting. So, um, and, and so it's really awesome that we are the only city on the planet, literally, that has two state-of-the-art convention centers in a downtown campus with, within a couple of blocks. That also makes it really complicated. Um, and we are working through with our stakeholders on um, revising our strategy on how we, how we market that because the hotel package that comes with that did not double, just the space for conventions did. And so we're working through that, but um, it, is, it is really exciting. Um, and I mentioned before that marketing tourism is a team sport. So we have a lot of partners that help us. And on the meeting side, um, we are an industry of acronyms, so I won't walk you through all of those. But these are industry associations and other important um, hotbeds of planners um, that, that work with us to, to move forward. So when things get complicated, we call our friends. I mentioned that we do direct to consumer advertising. These are the domestic markets that we're in. And I bring this slide up because you might wonder why are we in this city and not that city? And it's all in the science. Everything that we do is research based. So we choose the markets that we market in based on their propensity to travel. We monitor that on a monthly basis. We adjust our spend depending on the return on investment. It's all actually quite scientific um, and and cool, because it's nice to tell the story, um, and the ads are flashy and all that kind of stuff. But we also do this in very original ways. Um, I'll get, you saw the rain booth in the video. Um, this year's sort of innovative um, thing is we did coffee shop takeovers in cities, not Starbucks, but small, locally owned in um, in Houston and other places. And people would go to get their morning coffee, and they would they would be free, and they say it's on Seattle, and they get a, a QR code and an invitation to come visit. So, and then that elevates social media, social media buzz, right? That's the kind of stuff we can't buy. And so um, that's how we tell our story. Um, <clears throat> internationally, we are finally back in all of the markets that we used to be in. Um, we do have a, a fairly good staff, but on the international team, it's a pretty small group. Um, and so how we do that is we do it with partners. We do it in partnership with State of Washington Tourism. We do it in, in partnership with the port. And we also have contractors in each one of these countries that is local um, and knows the, the travel trade there and helps us tell the story of, of Seattle. Um, and we help educate them. Um, marketing is also um, an, an endeavor that requires a lot of partners. And you might not recognize many or any of the, well, you probably recognize Rolling Stone, um, but the, the, the logos on the screen are not common. And that's because we don't do things in a common way. Um, we do have some traditional partners, but these are the folks that help us develop content in a very different way than how people traditionally think. We don't want to do the same as Chicago or LA or San Francisco or Orlando and nor do we want to be them, um, but we do use partners that help us think differently um, and reach different audiences. Um, locally, um, and you, you met Michael Woody, your new corporate uh, member representative, um, is, is flushing out a department to help us tell the story of tourism a little bit better. Because I think probably, I saw some heads nodding, you learned a little bit today about what cont tourism contributes to our community. Um, and there's just so many stories to tell. What, it, what a convention brings to town, what, um, what kind of discoveries are made at that convention, um, how, how the, the Space Needle, well you probably know that story, got built. Um, but, but what tourism does for the community is a, is a, a story that we need to tell a little bit better. Um, and, and who visit Seattle is as a secondary is important, I think, for our residents to know too. As we grow that tourism economy, it's more important for our local residents to understand the importance of it um, because that's when traffic starts piling up and people start getting frustrated because they can't get in their favorite restaurant and things like that. So to help alleviate some of that frustration, helping people be better ambassadors um, is kind of what our mission is about. We also, I mentioned we use a lot of research. We also share it. Um, so we are um, growing our program to help share data so that we're not the only ones that are making smart, smart decisions, but so are our stakeholders and our partners. Um, and later this year, we are launching a new strategic planning process. Um, so there's a bunch of names flipping up on the screen. It's intended to be a very inclusive um, project. It, people ask me, what is my vision for tourism and for Visit Seattle? And I certainly have my own ideas, but this is a team sport. And so the vision really needs to come from our community. 
And, and um, as we go forward, we will be inviting you and, and others to participate that in that. You might get an online survey. You might be invited to a focus group. Um, we encourage you later this year when we reach out to you, please answer the call and, and be a part of, of what we decide Seattle's next chapter is going to look like from a tourism perspective. Um, there is a lot. Uh, to talk about and I had 20 minutes so there's your high level overview if you ever want me to do a deeper dive on something I'm happy to do that um, drink wine and um, yeah, there you go. questions sir oh. is this in of the regional competition between our market and others, notably the uh, port business where the great collaboration between the two deep water ports here in the central Puget Sound. Uh, uh, I'm curious about any initiatives or things that are helping align other uh, areas like the tourism industry. Uh, there, there are great museums in Tacoma. I saw, saw a shot of the Museum of Glass there. It just reminded me that uh, you know we're a region too. We are. And visitors don't really care where the borders are. So our jurisdiction is Seattle and King County. There is Travel Tacoma that takes care of all of Pierce County. Um, and there's a group called WSDMO, which stands for Washington State Destination Marketing Organizations. It's a, an, an, an association. Um, and it's all of my counterparts from around the state. We get together every two weeks on a call and solve problems or share information or other things. This is probably the most collaborative industry I know of because until it comes down to duking it out for the actual piece of business, a rising tide floats all boats. Um, and really from a, a DMO perspective, because a lot of us get public money, we need to help each other be the best we can possibly be. Um, so that tourism continues to be a force for good and not evil. Um, and so that, that, that we can sh share that economy. There's, there's plenty of business to go around. We don't need to be parochial about it. Um, so we work with the port, and I know that the, the two ports do, do work together. Um, overall, the, um, there's a state of Washington tourism entity that, that also um, is sort of that umbrella. So when we go to a trade show, for example, for international tour operators, we all exhibit together as a state, and then we refer people back and forth depending on what the needs of the clients are. Yes, sir. Demi, um, we're the Rotary Club of Seattle. Yes. And you just gave a great presentation on Seattle. We all love Seattle in this room, so we're very excited. We're also very excited as you as a fellow Rotarian. We will do everything we can to help support you in your endeavors. So Michael, just let us know in the surveys and things like that. But also when you're sitting in your planning meetings, if you have an idea and you're wondering, hey, could, could Seattle 4 help us out? Could, they, could there be an event or something that maybe we could, we could do that would build some fellowship within our organization? Keep us in mind for that as well. We're interested in being creative and, and involved and doing everything we can to promote Seattle and, and grow Seattle. That's, that's one of the main reasons why we're here. So thank you, and thank you for being a corporate member. Uh, we, we really appreciate that. We want to partner with you and support you as well, okay? Thank you, appreciate that very much. Hello, <clears throat> Hello. thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Mark Weed. I drove up from Southwest Pierce County today to be at this meeting. Thank you. I've been a member of this uh, Rotary Club for about 32 years. And uh, two years ago, um, my daughter suggested I get out of town for a while uh, because of something they were trying to figure out. And uh, so I have a, I'm still down there. Uh, two things. One is when you do your strategic plan, I would hope that when you talk about residents, and this has already kind of come up, is that you do look at the region as uh, uh, also an asset to, uh, to talk to. It doesn't make you in competition with Linwood or with Tacoma or with Bellevue. Uh, it just makes it better. The other thing about Seattle in general, and I'm, I'm an observer coming up here about once a week. Gentleman farmer. Gentleman farmer. <laughs> I married the rancher's daughter. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, color. Uh, downtown Seattle is kind of drab. And it's kind of brown. And even when the banners went up for Seafair, if those of you remember what they looked like, they were also very muted. And uh, so, you know, having fun, being a fun place, uh, 
let's have some fun with color. Thank you. You know, interestingly, um, on the strategic plan, Pierce County is also doing their own strategic plan. So we've participated in them, in theirs, um, and they will be participating with us too. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you for being here in your information-packed presentation. I was curious to hear what the Tourism Bureau is doing to counteract the stigma left behind by CHOP and whatnot. Thank you. The thing, huh? Um, it, it, it still affects us. I, I won't you know, shy away from that. And, and here's how we deal with it, is we help support local initiatives that are addressing those challenges. We support the mayor's initiatives uh, for, for One Seattle and for the, for the cleanup. We, we support the DSA, uh, the ambassadors, all of those kinds of things. So we get actively involved in participating in that work. In addition to that, we um, don't shy away from talking about where we're really at, but we also very aggressively push out what's really great um, because there's more great than not and and we are also not the only urban center in america with some challenges um, it was interesting i talked to my counterpart from orlando <laughs> um, the other day who's uh, she, she know and, and her comment was well in 2020 it was your turn and now it's ours because we're you know florida's undergoing their own um, reputational challenges with their legislation and, and whatnot there. Um, so it's nice to know we're not alone, but um, it, 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 essentially we just have very real conversations. We don't shy away from it, um, but we don't, we, you know, we don't bring it up. Um, but we do bring up what's, what's really great. So we try and focus on the good stories, but we don't pretend that that's not real. Hi, Tammy. Uh, I'm going to take the last question. Uh, talk to me about the, uh, the marketing changes that uh, are in place for this next generation, uh, Gen Z, and eventually it'll be the alpha generation. How, how, are th how is that outreach changing from a technology and communication standpoint? Thanks for the question. Um, as much as it's fun to show a print ad, we don't do a lot of that. Um, we, it, it, uh, it's very relational, right? So social media becomes important, but also is using influencers, um, people that tell the story for us. Um, we, we do um, mostly electronic or in-person um, events uh, like the Rain Booth or, or like the Coffee Shop or, or other things that are gonna start raising conversation about that. And that's the other reason why we need to be telling our story more with our locals, because we've got some locals that feel um, a little biased about downtown. Um, I've, I've seen people say, well, I don't, I'm not coming back from the east side to downtown because I'm afraid. You, you need to check it out. We're all here. It's quite safe. We're fine. Um, and, and so having our locals speak more favorably will help, um, but also have our locals understand how to respond when, when we, weird things come up will help. Um, the younger generation is a completely different animal. Um, thank goodness, because wouldn't it be terrible if we were all the same? So um, we, we um, employ young thinking people and younger people um, that are a little bit more in tune with that. You don't want me doing your social media. I talked about intelligence. Uh, I know I got like 10 seconds of what tell Beth comes in. Um, we do have a data symposium that is coming up at the end of the month. If you're curious, registration will open in another couple of weeks and that's where we're gonna be sharing just a lot of data about hotel occupancy and we have a couple of economists that are coming and Expedia will be talking about traveler trends and all of that kind of stuff. So um, it'll, it, it's two hours of action-packed coolness. I know that sounds terrible, um, but you're welcome to come. So thank you. Thank you, Tammy. And I, you know, I just have to say, I, I am grateful. Uh, yes, we bring fans and visitors here for sporting events, and then it's the Visit Seattle team that helps to make their experience extraordinary. How do they get around? How do they get to public transportation? How do they get to the stadiums? All of that. So we're grateful for that partnership. And I was also thinking, Jamie, you know, while we may all often think, oh, auctions, spending money, we also know that the outcome we, we want that money going to Seattle Children's and all of those other great places. So thank you for doing such amazing auctions that do such good in our community. We appreciate that. Uh, Tammy, I just wanted to say thank you again for your time today. Uh, in recognition of the time that you made for us today, we have 
made a donation to Harvest Against Hunger. 600 servings of healthy produce have been given in your name, so we appreciate that. Thank you. I want to also acknowledge uh, we have a brand new sponsor of Rotary, and it is Bloodworks Northwest. Thank you, Sue Nixon, for supporting that. Uh, now, as many of you know, we are uh, dangerously low on blood supplies in our region, and there's an urgent need for donors. So I want to recognize the club members who stepped up in the month of April to donate blood for those in need. I'd like to thank Alan uh, Konofsky, Al Nancy Cahill, Kathy Gibson, Fedva Dickman, I saw you on, on social media on Facebook, Ken Colling, and Bob Davidson. Thank you all, and I hope everyone else makes time for that. All right, we've got lots of announcements and great programming coming up, so we're going to first hear from VP of Membership Engagement, John Steckler, and then our Prince of Programs, Ken Grant. John. Make sure I don't fall off the stairs. Hey, everybody, got some new announcements for you. Uh, first, let's go to the next slide. Guess what? The Coast Guard tour is now sold out. Remember last week it was the um, uh, Convention Center tour, now it's the Coast Guard tour. So thank you all for getting out there and getting engaged with your fellow Rotarians. Let's, let me tell you about some of the things that are still coming. Uh, the uh, Sea Force is having a happy hour on May 25th. There's details will be in your newsletter, so take a look at that. Next slide. Uh, okay, let's, let's, let's pawn it again. It's sold out. Yes, it's sold out. Okay, next slide. Okay, I want to give you a little more information on that Pike Place tour, uh, uh, foodie tour. It's a foodie tour. This is a behind-the-scenes guided tour at the Pike Place market. You're going to learn so much about the market, but more importantly, you're going to get a taste of the market. You're going to get eight tastes of the market. Yes, eight. Yeah, eight different tastes. It is a great tour. It's $50 a person, but trust me, you will not be hungry when this is over. It is a limited number of seats, so there will be a sold out on this one. So go ahead and make your reservations. There are details on the website. We talked a lot about what's going on in Seattle. Uh, Bob Dunnigan, the v uh, CEO of Ivers, is going to give us a personal guided tour of the waterfront on June 8th. He is, I think, the last surviving original member of this waterfront re uh, reef generation that was uh, uh, started a long time ago. He will tell you the entire story about the water, waterfront as we walk down all the different changes that have happened. And best of all, we end up back at Ivers. He's putting on the food. We buy a no-host bar. It's a great time to spend with your fellow Rotarians. So put that on your calendar June 8th. Next up. OK, this is a bit of a different event. Here's we're going to try something very different. My, my dear friend and fellow cohort on VP of membership, Nicole Klein, is putting on another one of her networking events. But we've added a couple of twists to it, thanks to Doug Sato from the WAC. We're going to do this on the third floor of the WAC, where they have their um, uh, golf simulator. And we're going to actually have our networking event. We're going to have a business speaker. Uh, this business speaker, for 40 years, has been putting on successful growth plans for companies. And he's going to uh, give you the secret behind how he puts together those successful growth plans with his presentation called The Journey Before the Plan. All the things you have to do before you ever start to write a growth plan. The Journey Before the Plan. It's very interesting. The speaker is very dynamic. What else can I tell you about him? Oh, it's me. It's me. <laughs> I was, it's really uncomfortable to say it's you, you know. But it is me. Uh, and yes, I will be businesslike for once. So come enjoy a different side of John Steckler. And best of all, Let's have a little golf simulation afterwards. We got free food, we got golf, we got a business presentation, and we've got fellowship and networking. You better put June 15th on your calendar. All are welcome. Let's have a great showing for this. And I think I am done. I am done. Thank you, John. All right, as you heard earlier, next week we will be celebrating Asian American Heritage Month with an insanely cool panel uh, driven by our, is Ascent in the room? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. She, if you know her, is one of the dynamos of this club. She is bringing in, and I want to read this, Steve Hobbs, the Secretary of State, Lisa Mannion, the King County Prosecutor, David Della, the former C Seattle City Council member, and Catherine Chang, Seattle Mariners VP of People and Culture. So if you've missed any, next week's is not the one to miss. Uh, we've also got, oh, so if you're a big fans of Boys in the Boat, who's not a big fan of the Boys in the Boat? Uh, thanks to our friend Nicole, again, 
Uh, she has invited 22 Rotary members from SQUIM and 20 Rotaract members from SQUIM because somehow they're in with George Clooney and that high school in SQUIM gets to debut the movie. Wow. It's freaking me out. <laughs> so be tuned in for that next week. Awesome. Jamie, thank you so much. Tammy, thank you so much. I feel like I'm just surrounded by kick-ass people today. I'm just freaking out. If I had hair, it would be on the edge. Goodbye. <laughs>I heard was that George Clooney is going to be at next week's meeting. I, heard him too. I forgot that. <laughs> right, Nicole? Nicole's got my back on that. Read what you will. All right. Let's wrap this up. Last weekend, as you know, was another amazing one for Seattle sports. The Sounders, the Rain, the Kraken, and the Mariners all played at home and our Thunderbirds beat Kamloops in six games to qualify for the Western Hockey League Championship against Winnipeg. Now, the opportunities for sports were grand, but the results, I would say, are somewhat mixed. So let me bring you up to speed. While still leading the uh, MLS West, the Sounders had a disappointing loss uh, at home to the previously winless Sporting Kansas City. The Mariner offense has at best sputtered, I'd say, uh, and what could have been a 6-0 homestand sits at 4-2 after six top-notch performances by Mariner pitchers. Bill, how are we doing right now? Well, I'm sad to report in the bottom of the third, the Rangers are up 3-1, and Castillo's on the mound, but he's getting hit up a little bit. All right, so, well, all right, everybody send good, good vibes to our Mariners right now. Uh, now, our professional women's soccer team, the Rain, beat the Houston Dash in front of 6,000-plus fans and lead the NWSL standings. And now let's get on to their really fun stuff with playoff hockey. I know you all have the fever. Last Sunday, the Kraken exploded for five second-period goals and dominated Dallas. We had uh, our 40-goal scorer, Jared McCann, back with the team. The home sweep was anticipated last night, but Dallas did turn the table, playing a physically bruising game, if you watched. Uh, they had them leading the Kraken 5-1 and one after two periods and on their way to a 6-3 to three victory. So the series is tied 2-2, two and, two, and the teams head back to Dallas for Game 5 on Thursday at 6.30 and then are returning to Climate Pledge Arena for Game 6 on Saturday at 4 p.m. Now, winning every, every other game is perfectly fine with us because that puts the Kraken in line to take the series in Game 7 on Monday in Dallas. So, and we're better on the road anyway. And we're better on the road anyway, so we'll take that. So you're all up to speed for the moment on all things Seattle sports. And in the movie, A League of Their Own, baseball manager Jimmy Dugan, played by Tom Hanks, says to one of his players, it's supposed to be hard. If it wasn't hard, Everyone would do it. The hard is what makes it great. We are adjourned.